Thank you so much for coming. Good morning. And so I will be quasi reading, um, and I have some music examples and um, uh, sound examples and music examples as well. So, um, although uh, during the 20th century, he <coughs> was able to develop analytical methods to understand the internal working mechanisms of the post repertory. The expressive qualities of gestural textual elements of abstract concert music, this is music without text, have not been discussed widely. Inspired by Lerdahl's often quoted argument about serial, serial music's failure to create mental, mental representation, mm -hmm. this paper suggests that contemporary European art music written in the past 30 years accommodates unconventional. Unconventional here means not uh, conventional to topics. Uh, unconventional gestural textual types that are more likely to stimulate mental associations and focuses on a specific slow paced textual type in the light of various perspectives on music gestural theory. In the interpreting musical gestures, topics and tropes, Robert Hetton defines musical gestures as energetic shapes through time and constructs his theory of musical gesture on perceptual and cognitive competencies. In his recent book, The Theory of Virtual Agency, Hetton mentions that Ligeti's micropolyphonic textures offer the basis for plausible actential interpretation, which would direct listeners to build elementary dramas and narratives. Hetton also mentions that these sound masses have topical effects. Already in the 1960s, while Ligeti's atmospheres build upon the idea of creating direction narrative on the changing densities of clusters, Lutosowski's The Nation Games from the same year created its trajectory by juxtaposition of contrasting textual units, as is the case in both pieces. In the absence of tonal medium, clearly recognizable melodic structures, rhythmic growth, and iconic referentiality, I believe the strategic use of clearly perceivable textual and gestural shapes appear to be musical elements providing a first-hand dialogue between the music and its listener. Textual gestural elements with various levels of referentiality or intertextuality also appear in the more recent music of composers as structured rhythmic blocks, such as Ivan Fedele, Mikhail Javel, Unsukchin and Philippe Rao, among others, whose music is informed by mid-century modernism. In the repertory of contemporary music, uh, there are textual units which are open to representational associations, such as bebas, bird song, or conventional types as fanfare, like pianto type gestures or textures. Uh, which are developed in the music culture itself, and also non-conventional types appearing as the building, structural building blocks of contemporary repertory with strong extra-musical associations, one of them being a specific slow-paced type, zero gravity. In his article, Music, Gesture, and the Formation of Embodied Meaning, Mark Lemon mentions that, quote, the first step in the course of meaning formation may be seen <clears throat> in terms of processes that account for the transformation of sonic features into the presence of sensory qualities and motor action related features. These transformations can be termed either synesthetic or kinesthetic. During kinesthetic transformation, it is the dynamics of physical properties through time that generate in our perception segregated streams and objects that lead via integrated processing to impressions of movement, gesture, tension, and release tension. The zero gravity type of texture takes its label from its kinesthetic features. 
Um, this type of gesture metaphorically reminds me of the gestures and mood in a zero gravity environment, white and spacey, giving the impression that the gesture is static and not completely predictable. The working mechanism of the labeling process and the analytical approach in this paper unfolds in three levels. The first level explores the inner workings of the gesture pension units. The second relates musical motion to bodily motion through kinesthetic transformation. The third one establishes the correlation interpreting bodily motion metaphorically through its associated quality, which then leads to the labeling. To start with, I will analyze Etudes Borealis number two on Ivan Fedele. Um, so this is the Etude, and this is the first page of this uh, piece. Uh, it displays an almost a non-developmental, instantaneous type of music. The term of expression at the beginning of the piece, calmo e meditativa, a quarter note equal to 40, uh, reflects the quiet and spacey character of this textural type. The dynamic range remains in the piano throughout the piece, and all pitches are to be performed in a soft and sonorous way, creating associations suggesting the slow motion of an object or a person in a weightless environment moving in an involuntary sense of flow. As example one shows, zero gravity is represented here by the interaction of two individual melodic lines. The intervallic structure of the individual lines is coherently kept in skipwise motion, mostly oscillating between closer and distant intervals associated with the sense of uncontrolled, unbalanced motion. Close intervals, such as the major second or augmented second of here, when two lines come together as a measure four, uh, like there is an E flat F, um, one has the sense that it's a mere accident. <clears throat> one might ask here whether the description I have given above would also be appropriate for a passage in a pointless texture. The answer would be no, since music in a pointless texture moves within an infinite space. The variety of dynamics articulation and note durations constantly change as such that it is almost impossible for us to come across places or objects we remember from the past. As Lerdal explains, in such situations, the grouping of surface elements becomes impossible because of the lack of distinctive transition in the musical surface caused by constant change. In Fedele's piece, the peak space is limited to C3 to C6 until measure 70. There is a registered dispersal of pitch classes. Also present is a homogeneous sense of rhythmic formation, which gives the sense that the pitches move in a limited space. The irregularity of the static motion does not involve extremes. Now I will play this example. Let me try. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, we find the same type with the similar pitch collection in, in Mixtin of Ivan Fedele. Uh, this is a piece for ensemble. And in this work, work Fedele employs the same textural type in four slow pace sections. All four passages operate with the same pitch collection. Here we see the second slow section of the piece, measure 62 to 69. And this is my uh, second sound file. And this topical thing appears in the piano part again. as the main musical material similar to Fedele's Etudes Borealis number no. two. The whole piece is a composed accelerando, starting with an initial zero gravity type of texture in low register. Example three illustrates the first 13 measures. In the whole section, uh, six pitch classes are involved, uh, appearing each time at the same register. Yeah, this is the sound. around the whole tone scale. The melodic structure on the right hand frequently uses speedwise motion. The left hand is based on a two-pitch quasi-melodic structure moving in minor seventh distance. The next example will be from Michael Jarrell's Silage um, <laughs> for flute, oboe, clarinet, and orchestra. And um, the sections of this work uh, are arranged in a fast slow, fast slow order, where the zero gravity type becomes dominant in the slow sections. It is presented here distinctively both as background and foreground element. Um, an illustrative passage appears between measure 161 and 170. Example four shows a textual uh, reduction between these measures based on the new pitch entrances initiated by the oboe. We'll, we'll look at the uh, orchestra score later. The first test, uh, phrase of this, or this, the wave, uh, is based on an eighth pitch collection between measure 161 and 164. All new pitch occurrences, occurrences are sustained by the orchestra. And uh, later on, in measure 167 and 171, the additional three pitches uh, enter. Maybe we play the fourth example. In this passage, both the part of the soloist 
and the orchestra moved within the dynamic range of pianissimo and mezzo piano, mostly framed by a crescendo followed by a decrescendo. The swaying nature of the melodic line for the oboe between a four, P5, and G5, touching on the same pitches from time to time in an irregular manner between measure 161 and 164, together with the dynamic behavior of the passage, contributes to the sense of spatiality and emptiness. Throughout the passage, the new pitch entrances of the main melodic line in the solo oboe part are echoed by the orchestra. The passage starts in measure 161 with the synchronized doublings of the pitch entrances of the main melodic line by the orchestra, which then starts echoing them in an unsynchronized way. And this generates an unfocused blurry effect reminiscent of involuntary gestures of objects moving in a zero gravity environment, which cannot move straight to their target. So we have the next sound example. The zero gravity appears in the vibraphone part based on a seven pitch collection, mostly moving between B flat three and B five. The identical pitch classes appear at an identical register except in measure 26, uh, where a five is transferred to a three, and the tempo mark is a quarter to 42 to 48. The melodic structure involves large skips except the beginning of the, this passage. Both in Fedele and Joral, this type of texture prolongs the harmonic field. Uh, this is the next slide. Um, sorry. No problem. And we have the sound example now. It's six. This is the previous one. We need the next one. Yes, yes. that's great. And the last example is the second movement of Philippe Rao's tambo for piano and percussion. The whole movement is based on two melodic ones moving statically and independently, yet with similar gestural features exposing a significant rhythmic flow. Except for the piano's accented harmonics appearing um, during the passage, the whole texture moves in a limited dynamic space and sound world involving resonating temporal variety produced by vibraphone, glockenspiel, portales, and piano. As indicated in example seven, the melodic line that is based on large interval skips gives a sense of random oscillation between high and low pitches. Similar to the previous examples, the texture moves in the middle register from F sharp 3 to A5. The crotalis over sound to octaves higher, of course, and the employment of nine pitch collection between measure these measures is similar to the previous example of Gerard Silage exhibiting new pitch classes each time, 
and reiterating pitch classes from, from time to time. Now we have the sound example. Seven. Yeah, and last yes. As presented above, this type of texture is employed both on its own as the musical material of various pieces and as the main musical element in certain sections of larger works. Occurring both as a foreground and background element, the employment of this type of texture by various composers in a number of pieces indicates it belongs within the vocabulary to describe today's contemporary Euro European art music and has become a building block. In most of the cases, zero gravity projects a static musical feel and doesn't create expectation, nor does it signal later events. It doesn't have a functional beginning or ending. All parameters are immediately in play from the beginning to the end. There is a sense of motion provided by the entrance of pitches one by one in a similar manner. The absence of metric regularity and temporal development, the irregular exchange between large intervallic leaps and small skips and stable degrees of intensity throughout the piece, uh, throughout the textual unit, sorry, contribute to its non dual directedness, recalling the type of musical motion non directed linear time described by Jonathan Kramer in The Time of Music. Although such non dual directed motion provides a sense of arbitrariness, the coherent register disposal, constant employment of soft dynamics, homogeneous rhythm flow, and slow tempo generates a unified textual type, which allows the listener to perceive it as a specific musical event, diverging itself from its surroundings. As such, zero gravity behaves like a complete musical object unfolding gradually in time. Its relatively longer duration appears to be one of the main factors contributing to its associated quality. In comparison, for example, let's say, the short musical events or moments that we come across in total serialism, and this is very different. As explained above, the distinctive kinesthetic features of this textual unit contribute this associated quality beyond individual associations to a collective one. As analyzed, zero gravity might employ various types of pitch collections, suggesting that the pitch collections can be considered as a secondary characteristic component of this type of texture and finishing. Uh, since there is no previous study specifically focusing on this particular repertoire's gestural textual vocabulary from the listener's perspective, the title Zero Gravity is personal. The label here is founded on the expressivity of the textual unit throughout through its correlation to a phys physical bodily motion. So just to keep it short, I think labeling here is uh, important for teaching purposes, and it's a personal one. And I think talking about these issues is important because it talks about style, stylistic aspects in new music that we don't talk much. So I have to keep short, unfortunately. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Yes. Interesting presentation. I would invite Julia to uh, set her presentation up, and uh, during this uh, setting up, maybe we have a couple of minutes for questions from the audience. Yes. Hi. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting paper. I hope you uh, 
uh, said a lot about uh, kinesthetic features of ears. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a question in my wonder uh, uh, whether these kinesthetic features are in fact in European musical features in terms of ontology or just the extra musical meaning? Extra musical meaning. Extra musical meaning. Yeah. And, 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 uh, yeah. Second question. Um, is a kind of difference between tonal music and atonal music in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, these uh, kinesthetic sensations? I, I did look for instances in tonal, tonal repertory because I'm a composer, you know, I've been listening to all these pieces like when I was very young. And I was thinking like, oh, this is this trick again. Oh, this neatly does the same thing. And then I came across the topics theory. And then I, I thought, okay, they might be maybe the topics, but then I don't really want to go into the topics jargon much, but I just uh, thought that these are the stylistics. There is something in stylistic the similarity going on, and this is the language. And we should talk about this. And, and this is this, and we find extra musical associations in contemporary music, which are not based on post romanticism or external repertory. These are because these composers are following the modernist lines. This is the very important part of this whole thing. But there is a kind of uh, kind of agreement, social agreement about these associations. Yeah? I, I, I didn't make an experimentation. Yeah. But uh, I didn't feel like I had to do an experiment with the, the empirical in empirical meaning. This is what I think. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Thank you very much. We have a uh, little time for one more question. Yes. Two minutes. Thank you. Uh, that's a very um, rich presentation. Thank you. Lots of interesting things that one could ask. Maybe just to think about the tonal atonal because. Mm. There is one interval which seems to me perhaps to be critical, and I don't know whether you would agree, which is what I would call the altered octave. Mm -hmm. That is the descent by either a, a seventh or a, a nine. Yeah? Yes. And I wonder how much that sort of altered octave mm -hmm. is fundamental to this. Um, I've never thought about this, but maybe it is just. I mean, I would, I would think now that it wants to be the octave, but it goes one above or one below, yes, yes. and that's the effect. Yes. Possibly creates and contributes actually to this movement of unpredictability. That's so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very interesting. I'd say if it's an older octave, then it must be tonal music. Otherwise, you wouldn't know. <laughs> well, I suppose I suppose I'm saying altered octave. The one the octave. I don't. I don't think it wants to be an octave. I, 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 yeah. But I, but I do think that um, the negation of the octave equivalence is a is a positive musical move, if you like. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's sort of constantly denying octave octave trillions. And that's mm. maybe a contributing yeah. factor. Sorry. Thank you very much. Please. Just for a minute on this same uh, basis, my question is, okay, yes, the octave, it seems to be the something that lies, still lies behind this, even though it's denied uh, in our listening. You know, you we're listening to octave, we're listening to what we think yeah. should be an octave, something sort of that's almost yeah. like that, isn't it? But what I'm, uh, and this is what I'm challenging in my paper tomorrow, is that, um, you know, we could have music of the sort you've just been describing, which is built on uh, 11 tone uh, equal temperament rather than 12. And I just wonder what the significance is yes. of 12 tone equal temperament. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mentioned somewhere that, that you know, I, I showed seven examples 
and all of them worked uh, with different uh, collection of pitch classes. One was based on twelve tone. The other one was working with six pitch classes only. So I think the pitch pitch element here is a secondary thing. But the most important thing is the uh, the uh, the octave dispersion, the nuances, the tempo, and the skipwise motion all the time with oscillation between high and low and that kind of thing. So it could appear in different uh, sound systems. Yes, I would I be particularly interested in just going to, to 11 or 13 exactly. and seeing whether we were really hearing yes. anything yes. artistically significantly different. Probably so, not. It, it will create the same effects. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you very much for your contribution. Yes. Thank you so I'm much. sure that uh, we can continue with this discussion after yes. all yes. presenters present yes. their uh, papers and their talks today. Let me introduce our next speaker. It is Yulia Leszczynska from Stanislav Moniuszko Music Academy in Gdańsk, who will talk about uh, night music, which might sound similar maybe to zero gravity in some situation. <laughs> Let us see what's it about. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Is it okay to hear and, and speak to you today? Um, I suffer to apologize. I'm not the professor, I'm not even a PhD, so I try to uh, try to tell you an interesting story about one specific nocturne. Um, it's interesting more uh, because of the traditions involved in it, as I will talk about. Uh, so, in this speech, I would like to present my, my way of interpretation of Perkowski's Nocturne and to, to change the slide to, to show the, the basic information um, about the cast of, of, of the piece and what they say Julia was um, composing. Uh, it's a historical orchestra, it was dedicated to. Stanislav Lorenz, an art historian, museologist, uh, who saved works of art during the Second World War. Uh, and the theme of the Second World War and occupation will show up uh, in the next stages of my, of my speech. Uh, and after the war, the Stanislav Lorenz contributed to the reconstruction of the National Museum in Warsaw. So he had a lot in common with Perkowski as a social activist. He also contributed the revival of Polish culture after the war years. And before I reach the musical discourse itself, I would like to say a few words about the numerous contexts of the specific nocturnes. Uh, the motif of the night, the nocturne jazz, the tradition of Chopin's nocturne, the heritage of Szymanowski, uh, the Perkowski's life and creation, uh, and together they create a system of common signs and values. So these are the base, um, my context, the starting point for my interpretation. By the way, it's impossible to analyze the nocturne without any reference to Chopin, especially when it comes to, to the work by the Polish composer. Uh, okay. Right. So these are this context. Um, we can go. Uh, so, brief, briefly, information about the Perkowski. Um, he was um, a composer and a teacher. He was born in 1901 in Popechacze, today's Ukraine, and he died uh, in 1990 in Odkot, near Warsaw. Um, he studied composition with Roman Stavkowski at the conservatory in Warsaw and privately with Karol Szymanowski. Um, and this relation between him and Szymanowski um, has an impact on his activity, on his composing. Uh, there are lots of letters uh, between them, but I think it, this is a story for, for another speech about the relation between Perkowski and uh, Szymanowski. Uh, during his studies, he founded uh, an association of young Polish musicians in Paris. After returning to Poland, he became a director of a Society of a Friend of Symphonic Music in Warsaw and the Polish section of the International Society for Contemporary Music. And he was the vice president of Polish Publishing Society. Um, and now we go to the main thing, which I um, suppose have an impact on his doctrine, which was composed after the, the, the war. Um, during the occupation, 
uh, he spent the, this, the years in Warsaw, uh, where he organized secret concerts for uh, theoretical subjects and composition. He also participated in the Warsaw Uprising under the pseudonym Dr. Kuławski. And after the capitulation, he formed the Polish Transport Group in order to evacuate from also young people uh, who were fighting the wounded and the sick. Uh, now we can go to the next slide. Okay, we start with Notkins, briefly, of course. Uh, as we know, the Notkins journal appeared along with the sentimental trend uh, preceding early romanticism. Um, so the 18th, 14th could be considered as the beginning when the first three nocturnes by John Hughes were published, free to see the term nocturno functioned as the vocal instrument of serenade, and among the miniatures, the appearance of the nocturne work uh, was preceded by a uh, piano romanza and pastorella. Uh, according uh, to Mieczysław Tomaszewski, the outstanding musicologist and author of numerous publications about Chopin's music and the war, uh, the inspiration for Chopin notebooks were uh, have three basic sources. Uh, oh, okay, it's okay. <laughs> so, see, no, no, it's okay. Uh, so, it's a Fils Nocturne, Romance, Adagios, and Allegretto from, from pieces by the classics, and uh, Arietta Capo, of course. Uh, it is from the areas that the contrast of the middle section comes uh, from, and the intensified ornamentation in the red cries, and the inspiration of the Italian bel canto. Has resulted in a presence of uh, so called fioriturats, rubato, and Italian type of expression. Um, and to clear the factor of, of the nocturne that I compared, uh, Tchaikovsky's nocturne is a quote about the factor of Chopin's nocturne by Tomaszewski. In Chopin, the arpeggios chords appear in extensive arrangement, often consist, uh, constituting a segment of the overton scale. And the long breathing and expressive melody rises and falls into the shape of an instrumental aria, arioso, recitative, or song without words. The rhythmic accompaniment line is even and metronomically steady. The soprano line, extremely rhythmically different, equipped with extraordinary non numeric purities, slowing down and accelerating the pulse of the internal rhythm was combined to the norm of and spirit of tempo of battle. At the end of the book. So the night may sound with the nighting that is singing, with an old hooting, wall calling, or loose noises. It could be also full of emotion, a few hope, night full of love, loneliness, and night full of dreams and nightmares also. And Chopin said about his movies, and there, there were also about nocturne. That is the consolidation of personal thoughts, feelings, and impressions. And the notion, even uh, with Chopin, showed the deep diary of factors, forms, and expression. Uh, Lou Mazel described it that way uh, from the recitative to choral, from romance to march and dance. The very interesting conceptions come from the interpretation of Nocturne by Mieczysław Tomaszewski. He distinguished five types of Chopin Nocturnes, and we can choose the slides. This is a short fragment of the table that Tomaszewski showed. The pastoral ones, oniric, completative, elegiac, and pacific. Uh, and of course, I, I tried to, to, to combine some, some elements in Tchaikovsky's Nocturne, uh, inspired by that. Uh, uh, so, now I can start with the Nocturne by Tarkovsky. It's a musical piece for the orchestra composed in 1955. Uh, the premiere took place in the February of May 1957 and National Philharmonic in Warsaw, conducted by Stanislav Stromachewski. Uh, this particular Nocturne, despite the orchestra factor, stays in the shape of the miniature because of the duration of about 69 minutes. It is characterized by the reprise form referring to the shapes known from Chopin. Uh, the orchestra Nocturne was written in 1925, so it is no longer had to be subordinated to the idea uh, of social realism. Uh, this piece is one of the group of the works by Polish composers inspired by the night, 
and created in the several years after the war. Among them are, for example, Andrzej Panufnik's Nocturne, uh, Augustav Shepard's music for strings, Nocturne, Grażyna Pacewicz, Petrie, Turni, uh, and others. Uh, and I could say that in the direction of my further research. Uh, Zygmunt Mijelski, a Polish composer, journalist, and music critic, wrote about Perkowski's Nocturne that this work, uh, this work is very well listened, carefully measured, and precisely realized. Thus, in the described piece, the composer's attention to detail is clearly visible. Uh, another Polish musicologist, music critic, Bogdan Poche, in his review of the performance of the Nocturne at Warsaw Autumn Festival, placed between uh, the non-classical and post-impression style. At the same time, he described a very romantic, colorful, uh, effective, and perfectly instrument work. Uh, so the next slide. This is a structure, a form of our nocturne. Not really complicated, but try to work. So the first phase of the nocturne emerged from the silence. The narration of the piece begins with the percussion instrument and pizzicato of double basses and cellos. After a few bars, the rest of the string instruments would join uh, one by one. Before the entrance of the woodwinds, uh, the celesta ostinato shows up. Uh, and that ostinato repeats also at the end of the composition in A1. And it consists of four note motif in quarter notes and its further variations. The sound of the harp and the celesta together uh, make associations with honoring space. Uh, the repetitive motif in the celesta part introduces an element of the trance. A whole A part goes in sleepy lento tranquillo tempo. And at the same time, against the background of ostinato, there is a wide melodic phrase based on the three note motif. Um, now we go to the next slide, and there is a, a musical example. Yeah, yeah. Of the, and this is uh, a center of Celesta, and I will talk also about the uh, three note mode. Uh, the coherence of the fourth form is determined by the exploitation of the three note motif. It is present in variants throughout the composition, despite changes in texture of the structure. It can be defined a uh, motivation of integration. Um, we can switch to that one. Yeah, so there is a, a three note motif, it changes direction, it shows innovation. Uh, okay. I mentioned about it, I will, I, I will show you a whole analysis of all motifs of this nocturne because it's uh, um, So, um, the commencement of the next phase is preceded by a disturbance of the Celesta of Sinato. The phase B starts with the sudden fragmentation of rhythmic values, greater pulse activity of the snare drum, um, inclusion of figurative melodies, accented trochaic etanato shrift, dotted rhythm, also Dino and brass. Uh, no, I'm sorry, but it shows also different articulations. Uh, for example, full act of tomorrow, the sound of also Dino and brass. Uh, 
and the middle phase of the nocturne could be divided into four sections. So uh, two phases in, in part B. Um, the first one is lively and bustling, full of anxiety. Second one uh, would feel tea with very clear smooth layers structure. That is just an example of the beginning of the part B. similar to the this entrance, so we can uh, play an example. Chopin's Nocturne. 
If there is no memory drilling, but reflection on the inexorable passing of time and memories of the past. This memory is sometimes traumatic, uh, considering the recent experiences of the war occupation, appear in the middle section of the reprise contract with Miskowski. Rakowski himself described briefly his nocturne in his letter to Szymanowski. Uh, I, I, quote, I came back from Poznan yesterday. I wrote not to there. I think it went so sad. And end of quote. Uh, the time signature is even uh, in a whole piece uh, close to the melodious march. The element uh, which I consider to be great importance and referring to Chopin's alleged and contemporary nocturne is ostinato and repetitiveness of motives. Uh, it's also significant for this nocturne that the transgressive middle section, uh, Perkowski's nocturne could be referred to the primal expressive qualities of the nocturne by Tomaszewski, like emotional dream. Uh, next slide. Uh, without name. Without name. Yeah. Uh, emotional dream, self focus in response to a traumatic experience and reflection of the transience of the age of the world. Um, musical image of the night uh, in peace is the uh, juxtaposition of contemplation and mystery with a plan full of action, fear, dynamism, and maybe even the modesty. There is a visible opposition between uh, constancy and activity, state and the process. A and one and A1 shows the silent, mysterious night, maybe only brief. B and its internal phases shows nocturnal activity, human thoughts, memories, nightmares, maybe supernatural powers. Despite the title, composers do not give an extra musical commentary. So I have to confine myself to interpreting this piece as a musical picture of the night. It is visible that in that nocturne, he shows inner night, the night of the soul, human emotions and full of experiences. It's hard to limit that piece to easy illustration. It also escapes the stereotype of nocturne as it is based on ornamental melody and saturated with the romance or lyrical mood. It is precisely in this field that resemblance to the Chopin is visible. The fact that the nocturne has become a field for the expression of various types of deep emotion. Considering Tchaikovsky's close relationship with his master, Szymanowski, one can also look for the references to the night in the metaphysical dimension, the cosmic night, like, for example, in the first symphony version. Especially A and A1 part refer to Szymanowski aesthetics, especially because of the violent part <coughs> full of lyricism and ecstasy. Mozart middle part shows neoclassical origin and leads the listener to the climax of the composition. Here we are for uh, near your paper and uh, acquainting us with the uh, piece. Personally, did not appear or know about before. Do we have any questions from the audience? Maybe not the question. Thank you very much for your interpretation of this recording of Mieczysław Tomaszewski's typology. Professor Tomaszewski was my master, so thank you very much yes. for his ghost and voice. Uh, I have one question connected with this sphere of the night, mm -hmm. because Mieczysław, Mieczysław Tomaszewski interpreted music of Karol Szymanowski, you know, that Piotr Piotrkowski was private. Uh, pupil of Szymanowski. The Tomaszewski interpreted pieces of Szymanowski in category of night. Szymanowski was, according to Tomaszewski, the composer of night. We can also say that, for example, other composers are composers of the day. Uh, do you think that Perkowski was kind of this composer night and i would like to add that in this nocturnes by Chappelle, we have not only to do with uh, the type of eroticism sensuality of town but according <laughs> to tomaszewski to tomaszewski also with so-called heroics yeah. so nocturne is not only representation of love of night, but also of the struggle of heroical categories. What do you think about this trope in Perkowski's nocturne? I, I think it's, it is very clear shown, uh, especially uh, of the time, uh, after, after war times, uh, after occupation, 
uh, I think it, it still is with, with, with the uh, March climate, right? Uh, and I, I'll go uh, after the Moshe Institute, the Shimanov thesis, the next plan stage of my, of my further research. So I, and do you think Perkowski was a composer of the night, or maybe of the day, of other categories? <laughs> More right. Um, maybe um, there are few works that that are full of the of this kind kind of expression, but um, I'm not sure all of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 so much. Do we have any other comments or questions for you? <laughs> There's a couple of minutes left, please. <laughs> <laughs> Again, a very, very broad question about emotion. You use the word emotion a lot of the time. And, well, two things. One is how do we get away from that being a totally personal perspective? Mm -hmm. And two, in the examples you gave, you used words like anxiety. And I found myself sort of pondering the thought that Essentially, I was finding the pitch relationships in the music you were exemplifying mm -hmm. were pervasively full of unease, anxiety, and the only variety that came up was due to rhythmic aspects and perhaps um, te textual sort of thing. Um, I, I find this question about emotion in relation to this kind of music, quite a difficult one to tackle. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I know what you mean. Um, and I'm, and I need to say that uh, I shortened my, uh, my speech and I, I put out some uh, elements um, about, about, about the pitches, about the motives. Uh, so I try to make a um, a good form and go to the essence, maybe, maybe that is a mistake. <laughs> probably for all of us case every now and then because you already anticipate what you mean and other people have heard it or read it yet. So, <laughs> but anyway, it was an enlightening uh, presentation. Thank you very Thank much, you. Julia. And uh, now for the end of this session, we have one online presenter from the from over the sea, from the States. It's Clark Randall. Is yes, you? I'm here. <laughs> Hello, Clark. What's the time there where you are? Are you in New York? Um, it's almost 6 a.m. 6 a.m. Oh, good morning, then. <laughs> good morning. For well, the end of uh, our session, uh, we'll have an interesting presentation about the racial questions among the Black American musicians. So please, Clark, go on. Um, is there a way, because uh, I'm trying to share my screen, so I think you have to you have not share your screen. Uh, or for the presenter, yes. it was somewhere on the... So you are screen sharing. You sh you should stop screen sharing. You have to stop. Mm -hmm. You have to press the red one. And now, yeah, okay. Is it all right now? Yeah, I think it should be fine. Uh, let me. Can you all see it on your end? We don't see your screen yet. Oh, you can't? Um, it says it's sharing. Yes, we can see your screen, but we can't see the presentation. Okay. Um, yes. Not the presentation. It's here. Are you starting your presentation? Maybe. Uh, No, I see. No, I see. Great.
Okay, good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, so the title of my research um, is on screen, Still We Rise, The Effects of Racial Discrimination on Black American Musicians. Um, I would like to say before I start that I do believe that this research can apply to um, minorities in different countries, but this is all I had access to. So um, this is what um, I'll be talking about today. Um, so before we jump into the actual study, I would like to provide you with a few clear and concise definitions for a few terms that will be mentioned frequently throughout this presentation. Um, so first we have racism. Um, which is a set of beliefs or attitudes that tend to denigrate individuals or groups because of phenotypic characteristics or ethnic group affiliations. Um, so this is basically having specific set beliefs, beliefs about a group of people because of how they look, okay? So for example, a racist belief could be that, that Black Americans can't play classical music because they are less competent, competent than other races. Um, next, we have racial discrimination. Um, so racial discrimination, on the other hand, are the acts that support racism. So for example, if an orchestra is racist, they may act on their racism by being discriminatory and not accepting black musicians into their orchestra because they believe they are incompetent. So it's highly possible to be racist and not participate in racial discrimination, okay? Um, and lastly, we have, um, Black Americans, which are American descendants of enslaved Africans, Caribbeans, and Central and South Americans. So this study is going to be dealing specifically with Black Americans. Um, America has a long history of racism and racial discrimination um, that began in 1619 with slave trades continuing through the abolitionist movement the Civil War, the Civil Rights Movement, and with the current Black Lives Matter movement. Um, despite exceptional progress made in efforts to repair race relations in the United States, racial discrimination continues to plague the live, lives of Black Americans. Um, on this slide, I wanted to highlight a few statistics regarding racial discrimination in the United States. So the first statistic states that Black Americans are exposed to more racial discrimination than any other ethno-racial group. Um, this statement is further evidenced by a 1996 study that examined the frequency of racial discrimination amongst Black Americans. Um, it was found that 98% experienced racial discrimination in the previous year, 100% experienced racial discrimination at some point in their lifetime, and 99% found race, racist events to be stressful. Um, the second statistic here states that race-induced stress, which includes racism and racial discrimination, cause various psychological and physical ailments. Um, these ailments include depression, chronic anxiety, PTSD, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, premature, beer, premature birth, just to name a few. Um, with being exposed to stressful stimuli, coping is the natural reaction to resolve the feelings of stress. Coping is investing conscious effort in solving personal and interpersonal problems to overcome, lessen, or endure stress or conflict. Um, although it is important to utilize traditional coping models in examining how Black, American, Black Americans cope with race-induced stress, Studies have demonstrated that there are significant differences in the coping strategies of Black Americans than other ethnicities. Um, although research proves that music serves as an effective coping strategy, the historical function of music in the Black American community has continuously been proven to be a coping strategy that actually changes physical conditions. Um, in the table on the current slide, I've listed some historically Black music forms that have physically improved the racial climate in the United States. Um, so for example, we have slave work songs, which passed along messages, uh, Negro spirituals, which encur encouraged resistance to slavery, blues and early jazz voiced disappointment in politicians and made known the concerns of immediate social relevance. Jazz was a deliberate rejection of Western civilization and the so-called American dream. 
Rhythm and blues help instill Black pride and depicted life in the Black ghettos of inner city America. Bebop protested against signs and signifiers of Black inferiority. Church music and gospel helped bolster determination during the civil rights movement. And rap and hip hop called attention to the inner city plight and transmitted perspectives on so important social and political issues. Um, I've provided examples of songs in each genre on the right side of the table for those interested in taking a listen. Um, I would personally recommend Strange Fruit, which was written in response to hangings of Black people in the South and inner city blues. So if you want to copy those down, you can. Um, so although research has shown the benefits of music listening overall to well-being, no studies to date have examined how music acts to buffer against negative, negative psychological risk factors associated with racial discrimination. Um, although there is some historically based research expressing the importance of music to the Black community, as evidence in the table on the previous slide, they not only fail to examine how music affects the perception of racial discrimination, in the general Black American community. But further, they fail to exhibit how racial discrimination affects the lives of Black musicians that create and perform the music the community uses as a coping mechanism. So in this research, uh, we will be answering the question, what are the effects of racial discrimination on Black American musicians? Our, object, our objectives include establishing a base of insights on racial discrimination and Black American musicians, understanding underlying motivation, attitudes, and perceptions of participants, and moving detailed insight into problem definition and hypotheses for further qualitative and quantitative evaluation. Um, the study design was qualitative, highlighting the intricate and multifaceted effects of racial discrimination on the experiences of Black, Ameri Black musicians in America. Um, a qualitative approach was chosen to elucidate issues that might link experiences of racial discrimination to the ways in which music is composed and performed. Um, qualitative methods are useful in helping researchers better understand the actual experience of the oppressed people while giving members of this group space to voice their experiences, which are otherwise marginalized in silence. Participants were recruited via methods of snowballing, maximum vari variation, word of mouth and email solicitation. Um, individuals interested in participating were sent an email, including a copy of the participant information sheet and consent form. Um, participants were selected based on two points of inclusion criteria, including must be Black American, adult musician, born and raised in the United States, and actively performing in at least um, one of the following genres listed here. So hip hop um, and R&B, which is rhythm and blues, jazz, blues, gospel, soul, funk, or classical. Um, although classical music has not been previously mentioned on that, um, slide with the table. Um, I wanted to include it in the study because it is widely known that there has been um, and sometimes still is racial discrimination taking place in orchestras, concert halls, and other um, classical music settings. Um, so the, the study's final sample consisted of four participants, three men and one woman. Um, all participants were of the Black American race and ranged in age from 24 to 84. Um, of these participants, three were holders of their bachelor's degrees and one um, a music history professor. Um, of the three graduates, two held degrees in music from um, historically Black universities and jazz studies, while the other held his degree in sociology from a private, predominantly white institution. Okay, um, the primary source uh, of data collected in the study was from interviews, um, semi-structured interviews. Um, I utilized this approach because it allowed me to have a conversation um, to develop um, and engage um, the participant in a way that helped me better understand their experience. 
The interview protocol consisted of open-ended questions regarding participants' experiences with racial discrimination and its impact on their lives as professional musicians. Um, I asked each participant the same collection of questions. However, due to the subjective nature of the research, um, some queries elicited different information leading to a slight variation in the clarification questions. Um, in addition, each participant was given the opportunity to add any desired information at the end of the interview that may have not been covered during questioning. Okay. So finally, this overall table was built to organize the study's final overarching themes after analyzing the interviews. Um, and the sub themes are also listed here um, on the right side. So the three overarching themes were com uh, compromise, cultural, inclusive, formal education, um, abbreviated success due to cultural appropriation and required resilience. Um, so due to time purposes, I'll only discuss in detail the most prominent theme that emerged, with, which was um, compromised cultural inclusive formal education. Um, so cultural inclusivity is a classroom setting where students and staff recognize, appreciate, and capitalize on diversity so as to enrich the overall learning experience. In the case of this study, cultural inclusivity was compromised in all participants expressed a clear lack of cultural inclusivity in all of their formal education experiences. Um, this is evidence in two of the following statements that I took from the interviews. Um, so the first one states, all my life I wanted to study piano and I couldn't get a decent teacher because I was black. The whites that knew of my talent wouldn't teach me. Um, and the second quote here states, I wasn't given proper scores or the proper printing of these scores to study from it and it was purposely done. So although lack of cultural relevance in course curricula and racial discrimination in the classroom greatly impacted the participants early musical career, resilience was built through at home racial socialization practices particularly through cultural socialization and preparation of bias, which allowed the, participation, the participants to have a more positive outlook on their musical education experience. So um, racial socialization are methods and ways in which parents teach their youth what it means to be black. So I stated that this was like an at-home thing. So it was way, way away from education. It became the parents' responsibility to you know, induce, um, to let them know what it means to be Black and what they had to go, what they will have to go through for that reason. Um, cultural socialization and preparation for bias are two different types of racial socialization. So cultural socialization is the one by which parents communicate cultural values, beliefs, customs, and behaviors to their child so in the case of one of the participants, her father communicated some of these cultural values by the use of film. Um, the experts state, um, or sorry, the excerpt states, um, my father refused to have us unaware of our history. I had to be seven or eight. And I remember just sitting in the living room with him watching Eyes on the Prize films. Um, so for those who do not know, um, Eyes on the Prize is a set of eight to 10 films that highlight, highlight in detail the plight of Black Americans in the United States. Um, and although these films are a very, very common method of racial and socialization in Black American households, they are very serious, very gruesome, and depict a lot of lynchings and other violence. It's not censored or anything at all, but parents do feel the need to show their young child, and in the case of this, um, seven or eight these films, so they know what it means to be Black in America. Um, for me, it is quite disturbing that children seven or eight years old have to watch truths like this to begin building resilience at a young age. Um, preparation for bias refers to parental efforts to increase their child's awareness of racial, racial prejudice um, and ability to cope with racial discrimination they may experience. Um, the supporting uh, quote here states, 
And I mean, my parents would also tell me like, because I'm black, I have to operate at a level of excellence that is beyond my counterparts to even be considered equal with my counterparts. Um, in this case, as in many cases, children are made aware of the truth that they will have to face living as a black man. Um, there are many racial socialization messages um, that allowed the, participation, uh, the participants to have a more positive outlook on their music education experience as evidence in the quotes below. So the first participant stated, being black and facing hardship just made me determine that I wanted to do the best and the best, or I wanted to do the best that I could. Um, the second participant stated, but I would never let my being black prevent me from doing what I could do. And that's how I stepped above racial discrimination. And the third participant stated, I will say that you could never tell me I was when I was growing up that you can't do this or you can't do that, or you won't be able to do this. My argument was I can and I will. Um, so after analyzing the data, the following conclusions were met. Um, we have racial discrimination is deeply ingrained in the framework of American society. Um, music listening and creating is crucial in healing and building resilience toward racial trauma. Music carries direct accounts of historical oppression and it is a daily reminder of how far black Americans have come and how far they still have to go. And there is a high level of symbiosis in the creative process. Um, now, this one was one of the more interesting conclusions to me. Um, in all of the interviews, the participants expressed that when they experience racial discrimination, they turn to creating and performing music as a method of coping. But in turn, the music that they create and perform also serves as a coping mechanism for the surrounding Black American community. Um, in this way, multiple parties are able to cope off of one product, but in different ways. So the musician is coping by creating and then the surrounding community is coping by experiencing the creation. Um, the next one we have is empathy within the musical community or this is a deeper sense of connection to other black musicians because of similar creative flights. Um, cultural appropriation and fetishization attributing to the lack of opportunity available to Black American musicians, leading to a lack of Black musical representation in the media um, and religion and the music of Black American musicians, the, black, the music the Black American musicians create helps them maintain their personal resilience in the midst of racial discrimination. So the impact of this research, um, is to provide data to pedagogues, training Black American musicians to better position them for progress and success. Um, this can include maybe some sort of racial socialization training that could make curriculums more culturally relevant and diverse, in turn, increasing the drive, motivation, and admiration of Black music and its international impact. And that is all. Thank you very much, Claire, for this presentation. I wonder if there are some questions or comments from the from the audience. I'm sure that everybody, all of us, all but not black, faced with a certain form of discrimination during our lives. So I'm sure we can show sympathy with what we heard about. There are no uh, questions from the audience. I would have a question. Uh, I'm interested in, uh, I'm sure that you will continue with it, this research because you mentioned that this will only provide hypothesis for further research. So I'm mm -hmm. interested in your future avenues uh, for research. If you could say a couple of words about what you plan. Yeah, um, I do think that I just want to expand this research a bit. Um, in that a few of the, um, the participants all went to the same university. So I know there's more diversity in that area. Um, 
and you know different people have different experiences so I know that there's a wider range of experience that I didn't get to um, touch on or that I'm not quite sure about yet but also um, I'm hoping to you know kind of come up with a way to make this research more I guess to put it in universities as something that is actually applied to curriculums. Um, Cause I will even say like my, ex being black American, I had, um, cause I went to the Royal College of Music in London. So I had those experiences similar to this while I was doing the research in London. So, you know, it's not just within, you know, black American, universities and the view point of um, black musicians is not just within America. So probably also, you know, expanding the research to do it, you know, in the UK and other parts of Europe as well. Well, thank you very much for your answer. If we don't have further questions, I wish you a lot of luck and success with your future research. And thank I you. wish us all a pleasant afternoon and see you at lunch or maybe in the next uh, plenary session. Thank you very much and good night, Mark.